Okay, now we are gonna go to the simulation environment, but first remember our original block flow diagram. So the main idea right now is to add the hydroalkylation reactor using the provided conditions and the reactions provided in the statement. And then we're gonna add the mixers uh, that will allow us later to combine with the corresponding recycles. Now from the properties environment, we are gonna go to the simulation environment. Remember, if you haven't done so, to save the document. So probably when you open this environment, you the model palette just pop up. If, if, if you don't see it, okay, you can uh, basically come here to a uh, flow sheet modify and you can click model and streams and automatically the palette will appear. The other, the other cool thing that HiSeed has is that he, when you grab and drag this uh, palette, automatically this functions appears and they're allowing you to drop the, the corresponding palette anywhere you want. Some people like it on the bottom, I like it on my, on my right side. So it's up to you where you wanna locate it, but at least it's out of the way, but there when you need it. When you're designing a process, right, in the early stages of your design, you may not know the actual physical physical phase of the products. Uh, in this case, name it, you want the product to be in the vapor and the liquid. So once you know that, right, what you do is that you try to provide, like give different unit operations that allow you to enter the reactants and allow the products to leave the uh, process flow diagram at the right uh, conditions, right? Vapor, liquid, uh, a gas, whatever is the uh, physical state uh, as it come into the plan or gets outside the plan. So notice from the block flow diagram that the reactor is operated at 494 PSIA and uh, 1,268 Fahrenheit. So that means we must control the temperature, therefore the energy must be added to the reactor to keep it isothermal, okay? This is very important. You can decide what the type of reactor that you use. So what we're gonna do now is to add the reactor. So we're gonna come here to reactors. And there are multiple type of reactors. There's other videos where I cover the type of reactors, but we know that in this case, we are gonna be using a conversion reactor. I'm gonna add it anywhere on the PFD. If you put a two on the left or two on the right, you can always come here to zoom to fit and automatically will cover, you know, will fill the uh, window with the uh, process that you have created. I don't want it that big, so just gonna come here in the zoom and fix it. We're gonna double click the reactor. We're gonna call this reactor, reactor, whatever name you like uh, for the purpose of the, this video, right? And my students, uh, we're gonna la la uh, label it reactor, then your last name. Typically in a process, you can put fermentation, you can put a hydroalkylation, right? If that is a pro the, the type of reaction that is happening. So typically the reactors resemble the process that is happening inside. So there's a, uh, so basically you can add the inlet streams and you can add the outlet stream. Notice that you don't have them available. There's two ways to, to add streams. So you can add them directly from the the, this window, I'm gonna move this to the right side. So if I do that, I'm gonna continue to use the nomenclature uh, of the statement. So it's gonna be S1. Notice that the stream is uh, automatically added for us. S2. Okay. If I come here to the right side, I can click here, vapor, and then liquid. Once again, these names are arbitrary. You can label it whatever. It could be a product from the reactor or going to separator, whatever is the appropriate label for the stream. You can continue to use number. Whatever you desire is the way, best way to describe the process flow diagram or the block flow diagram that you plan from the beginning. 
This is where I was telling you that it says that the energy is optional. So you can have two type of reactors, an adiabatic reactor where you do not control the, uh, the, the temperature of the reaction. Let's say that you have an exothermic reactor and it's oper operated adiabatically. What you will see is that the reactor is not controlling the temperature. So if the reaction is uh, uh, releasing energy to the environment, so the perception is that the temperature will be increasing in the surroundings, right? Which is the reactor. Uh, if you want to control the temperature, so the reaction is, is still adiabatic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the reaction is still exothermal, but you don't want the reactor to exceed certain temperature just because, you know, you can foul the, re the you can fold the, the catalyst, it is a safety concern, you know, there's many things that involve having high temperatures, you may have runaway reactions, you may have different th uh, type of problems, right, when, when you have uh, increased uh, temperature, including the cost of the equipment, right, that can be affected by temperature. So what you do is that you create a reactor that is isothermal, right, and typically the data, the kinetic data that you obtain from the literature allows you to uh, make those that those type of decisions so in this particular case we're going to add energy when it says that energy is optional that is a lie if you leave this in blank what is going to assume is that you will not control the energy but there's energy transfer from the reaction to the reactor which is the surrounding in the system surrounding the system which is the reaction so i'm going to just add here reactor duty because i know that is i need to control the temperature I want you to notice that automatically when I do this, reactor duty appears here. The other thing that I want you to notice is that here in the bottom, it tells you what to do next. What we're gonna do is come here to reactions and we're gonna add the reaction that we want inside the reactor. Remember reaction set number one includes two type of reactions, right? Reaction one, that is in, a, in series with reaction two, which, which is the side reaction, okay? So automatically is located here. You can always come and see and verify the reaction so you don't have to go back to the properties environment. And you can do the same thing for reaction two. Notice that the next thing is the duty of the reaction, uh, of uh, the unknown duty of the reactor, I'm sorry. So we know that the reaction is liberating or is absorbing energy depending on the rate of, heat of reaction, but now we're not talking about the reaction per se, is the how is the reactor, right? The surrounding, what are we doing to the surrounding of the chemical reaction to be able to control it? So when they say unknown duty is related to the control, right? That you're gonna do in the temperature for that reactor. So before I move on, I want to uh, come here to, well, let me come here to the worksheet, right? And you can see the, uh, the table in, in empty, right? We, we don't have anything added yet. So the cool thing about having uh, double-clicking the reactor and coming here to the worksheet is, is that you can see all the conditions for the different streams, right? Unfortunately, we cannot change all the information necessarily from the reactor, but at least allow, allow us to take some control without clicking, like moving around between different windows and clickings. Uh, and clicks, I'm sorry. So the other thing is that you may have your com uh, your simulation in different units, like probably in SI system, which is one of the systems that I use the most. However, this particular statement is in field units or engineering units. So I will pick, uh, put it in field units uh, just to make sure that um, the numbers that I'm adding is already on the right uh, unit so I don't get confused, but automatically this converts for you. Uh, there's other type of unit sets. For example, you may have safety engineering, you may have field units, but with using PSIG instead of PSIA as the temperature, as, as the pressure, notice here. There's different ways to do this. And there's also ways for you to set your own units and prefer units, depending on the industry that you're located. Um, if you want to learn how to do this, you can just click unit set and then click the help button and automatically will jump to explaining you how to do that. Okay, so notice that there's nothing coming into the system. So if, if you don't have any temperature provided, so for example, we can play with this, right? I know that for now, uh, my inlet, I'm going to assume that my inlet is already at the temperature of the reactor. I'm going to assume that my uh, other reactant, right, uh, in the stream is at the same temperature. Probably we're going to add some temperature pressure changer later when uh, we after we distribute the chemicals, but we're going to leave it like that right now. 
We know that the pressure is 496 PSIA and here 496 PSIA. Notice that automatically the liquid vapor and pressure was calculated for us because we're assuming that delta P in the reaction equals to zero uh, in, the, in the reactor. That's something that you can actually modify right here. You see delta P equals to zero can automatically do this. So it, it is calculated for us. If you do have a temperature or pressure change, you can calculate the delta or what you just can do, what you, what you just need to do is to actually add the, calculate the delta leave, or leave this in blank. I'm gonna come here, delete this, and it's gonna look empty, okay? And when that happens, then you need to add the corresponding pressure of the exit. I'm just gonna go back here to leave that simple. I'm gonna leave it zero PSI. Okay, I'm gonna come back here to the worksheet and notice that it's calculated for us. Notice that we don't have any calculation of the temperature and the reason is that we need to set the temperature right for the reactor to control right the reactor to control so we know it's the same temperature that we have here just because we know that in the future we're going to be able to um, add temperature and pressure changes to make sure that the uh, we pre-treat the reactants to enter closer to the reaction conditions as possible but for now, we're going to leave it like that. We're concerning right now to the, uh, with the mass balance and not with the energy balance of the system. We're going to deal with that later. So notice that there's not unknown duty and I see there's nothing calculated. And then I come here and I check my solver to see if the problem is the solver. And I notice that the solver is active. So there's no problem with the solver. So the thing is that there is, uh, there is an unknown duty because there's no mass passing through the system, right? So we need to set that up. So I'm going to just come here. and come to S1. You can always come here to undo it, okay? So um, you can come here to S1 and do the same thing, right? It, it comes, it prompts you to S1. I just wanted to see, to show you that you can do it either way. Okay, so now we're gonna add a mass or amount of matter coming into the reactor. So we're gonna do an assumption uh, of, you know, a mass basis. This is arbitrary. What just what I want to see is I is the reaction that I added working inside the reactor, right? So what I'm gonna do is just add. You can add moles, the total amount of moles or the total amount of mass. Just for the sake of uh, following my notes, I'm just gonna do 100 uh, pound per hour, and then 100 pound per hour. Notice that nothing is happening, uh, and the reason is because we need to indicate in the streams the composition. So I'm gonna come here to the stream and then I'm gonna indicate that in that stream I have all hydrogen coming through S1. This window is gonna pop up and you can leave it one like that or you can add zeros, it doesn't matter. Um, just don't normalize, add the fractions that you need. Here you can change the um, uh, basis if you have it in terms of moles per hour or pounds per hour, so you can indicate what is the, the correct basis. I'm gonna click OK. Notice that as soon as I click OK, the stream is converged. Okay, so it's, it is working. So now I'm gonna come to S2. Also notice that it changed from light blue, unconverged to converged. I'm gonna now come to S2 and do the same thing. I added 100 mass flow. I have to indicate that in the stream, I have all toluene. Okay, I'm gonna click OK. Both uh, streams are converged. Notice also that the reactor is converged. Something that I want you to see, I already changed this here on my video, is that uh, the stream that was liquid Originally, liquid under this condition, there's no liquid at this condition. So what you can do is to ease your uh, process flow diagram and identify the important streams is that you can label this L fake. Uh, I will show you later how to uh, hide this type of uh, streams, but it's better that you do that later when you clean the process and you're making sure that 
nothing is coming out of it. Sometimes you optimize and change the conditions and then something is coming out of, L of whatever you thought it was L fake. So for now, I'm going to leave it and do not, I'm not going to hide that stream. So the other thing is that because I know that all of my vapor or my product is coming from S from the vapor stream, I'm going to go ahead and change it to S3. Uh, so you can just double click here. I'm sorry, you can just click once and type S3 uh, and automatically that will update the name from Vapor to S3. Remember that I'm uh, using the block flow diagram from the statement. Important things that we want to check is in this stream S3, if, is if we're getting exactly what we need, right? So you can come to compositions, Right here, you can see the overall conditions, but then here in compositions, you can actually see the different compositions of your you know, components in the mixture. Notice here that you have everything here in molar flows. If you want to change the molar fraction and see the molar fraction, this in molar fraction, you can come here, change basis, mole fraction, and automatically that will be updated. Notice here, right, that for all of the components, you have the different composition. Notice that the conversion for biphenyl was 2%, right? And you can calculate this by the total amount of benzene to see if that reaction is actually working. So this is a good way to check if the reactions are actually input correctly into the reactor. If you notice here, for example, that you're not getting anything of the biphenyl, which is the side reaction, and you have enough benzene, right, produced to convert it to the biphenyl, then that means that you did something wrong, maybe on the ranking, on the coefficients, on the conversion, maybe you added too small, like point, instead of 2%, you added 0 0.02. So this is why I like to use like a simple base calculation to make sure that the reaction is working inside the reactor. So this is the moment that you need to go back, trace your, trace your steps and check where you have the issue, but we're going to continue.